watch it. Mine, yeah, how are you doing? On the right page there. <laughs>
you, Soul Fire, for leading us into worship. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Thank you very much. So let me teach you a little sign language. Put your palm out like this and go like this. This is to forgive. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses. We can also flip them over as we forgive those who trespass against us. Today we're going to learn from Joseph in the Old Testament reading and Jesus in the Gospel re reading to let go, to forgive others when they have sinned against us. And we definitely need the Lord's help and the Spirit's power to be able to, to do that. Just a couple of, of other announcements. Next Sunday will be Transfiguration Sunday. So we'll be ending the season of Epiphany. And then the Wednesday, March 2nd, will be Ash Wednesday. And we have uh, some special uh, Lenten devotion books that we'll make available next Sunday. And again on Ash Wednesday, we'll have communion as well at those services on Ash Wednesday and imposition of ashes for those that choose that. So we will go back to having a 12.15 and then an evening uh, service each of the Wednesdays during Lent and then also for Monday, Thursday and, and Good Friday as we prepare to celebrate our Lord's uh, passion and his resurrection. And let's see, are, are the Henshaws here? In, yes, yes, where? There. No, not the Henshaws. The Henshins. There they are. They switched sides. So early service they sat over here. Now they're getting their whole other look. So Rebecca and her mother Rhonda Henshin, let's welcome them to Messiah. Uh, they are here visiting. Uh, Rebecca will be graduating. Oh, I can get the Concordia right today. <laughs> Late service. Uh, from Concordia, uh, Seward, Nebraska in, in May. Uh, but we have interviewed her for our uh, second grade teacher position, which will open up at the end of the school year when Kathy Cade uh, retires. So we'll have an opportunity to celebrate Kathy's ministry among us too. But, uh, so the way it works when, with candidates, uh, you know, we can say, would you like to designate to come to us? And then she has to make that decision perfectly. Uh, I think by tomorrow, right? So uh, we'll have you in our prayers and you can lift her up too. But also prayers for safe travel. That we, driving back up to Nebraska uh, today uh, as well. And uh, part of the special for worship next Sunday, for Transfiguration Sunday, uh, besides the uh, choir and, uh, and the soul fire, we'll have our brass and our bells we'll be adding to our worship uh, celebration as well. So awesome opportunities to do that. So I think I got all my notes here. Oh. Team. We are restarting team on Wednesday. Uh, so that's our after school ministry. And if any of you would like to help, we put together teams that cook and provide the meal. We get everything ready. You just basically come and prepare it. So if you might want to help with that, I know Amber would love to have some more folks help. We have like three or four teams that rotate in each week. But we also could use some help, I think, with uh, folks that come and sit with the different kids at their tables during the dinner half hour, which is 5.30 to 6 o'clock. So if you can help in any of those ways, uh, you, know, you can call office or talk to Amber and, and let her know she helps coordinate that with Kelly Wallace. So with that, let's go ahead and stand up and join in our opening hymn, uh, 706, Love in Christ is Strong and Living.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you'd like to use our kneelers, I invite you to kneel, or you can be seated for our time of confession today. This morning in early service, we used Divine Service 4, and this is a part of that liturgy of confession. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. We do take a moment in our time of personal confession. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. And here are these words of absolution. As you're called and ordained servant of the word, and in the stead, and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for our prayer. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as Soul Fire leads us in our confession song, Forgiven. Thank you. 
Jesus as Pastor Henschel shares them with us this morning. Today is the seventh Sunday after the Epiphany of our Lord. The first reading is recorded in the Old Testament book of Genesis, chapter 45, the theme of which Joseph provides for his brothers and family. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is again taken from the resurrection chapter of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 15. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Why are we in danger every hour. I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. 
And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there's one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ from stars in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as we honor the gospel word to us and have opportunity to make our confession of faith. The gospel chosen for today is Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. As you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now we confess our faith together using the word of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. We want to invite the kids to come on up for the children's message. And again, a special welcome to our guests today. Here you go. Thank you. If you'll fill out the, both sides, there's our little connect cards in the bulletin here. You can just tear those off like that. And yes, if you'll fill out both sides, and members can do the red side, and pass those down to the end of the row. All right. Haley, will you be my helper today? I need a helper. All right, come on. So we're going to talk about forgiveness. Yeah, some of you can sit in the back row there. That's okay. So did you see when I showed sign language, can you do this with me? Put your hand like this and go, whoosh, like you're sweeping it away. And you say, that's forgive us, but we also want to, I'll flip them over, forgive other people when they sin against us. All right, come on up here, Haley. Now that she's up here, I'm going to tell her she's going to be a monkey today. 
because this is my this is my monkey trap. This is how they kept, capture monkeys. They'll put something inside of like a tree trunk with a hole in it, or maybe a big mound of dirt that hollowed out, and they put the banana inside, and when the monkey reaches in, he won't let go of the banana, and he's stuck. But we're gonna pretend this isn't a banana, this is a softball. We're gonna pretend this is when somebody does something wrong that hurts us, or hurts our feelings. Has anybody ever said something that hurt your feelings? How about let's ask the adults. Has anybody ever said something that hurt your feelings? Yeah. Has anybody ever pushed you or given you a sock or hurt you that way? Yeah. How about you adults? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but God says we're supposed to forgive them or let go. That's what the word forgive means. So I'm going to have Bailey put her hands through the hole here and grab a hold of the softball number. Once your hand is in there, just one hand. Go ahead. Now you can't let go of the ball, okay? Now, try to get your hand out without letting go of the ball. What happened? She's stuck. She's stuck. She's trapped. And the only way... Okay, let go. Yeah, it does hurt. <laughs> Thank you. You can sit back down. <laughs> you are one of the best monkeys ever. Way to go. Yeah, when we can't let go, then we're stuck. Yeah, in fact, that's what the devil says to us. He says, don't forget, you hold on to those things. But Jesus says, no, he says, let go, and then you're free. And, and even you said, it hurts. Yeah, when we don't let go, it doesn't necessarily even hurt the person who's hurt us. It really hurts ourselves. So we're going to pray and ask God to help us. Whenever someone does something wrong to us. We want to forgive them. Can you do that? Forgive them. And then when we do something wrong to somebody else, we also want to say, forgive me, just like God forgives us. Okay? So fold your hands. And adults, you can be the echo with the kids today. Dear Jesus, help us to love like you love. Help us to forgive like you forgive. When we are wrong, help us to let go and be free. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, the acolytes will give you guys a bulletin as you go back to your seats. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, Forgive Our Sins as We Forgive, hymn 843.
we see a great wrong done to someone, actually our, our first response is probably more like, how can you forgive that person, right? And I, I think of the, remember a few years ago, the Baptist church out on the East Coast, uh, gunman came in, you know, pretended to be part of the Bible study, and stands up in the middle of the meeting, begins shooting and kills some of their members, and, and yet those members of that church, following the Lord's call and command and example, forgave. And people wondered, that, how can you forgive? Well, I read this story. It's a true story about a man named Chris Carter. He lived and grew up in uh, Coral Gables, Florida. He was abducted when he was 10 years old. And his kidnapper, they found out later, was angry with the boy's family. He burned him with cigarettes, stabbed him numerous times with an ice pick, shot him in the head, and left him to die in the Everglades. Amazingly, Chris survived, though he, he lost sight in one of his eyes. No one was ever arrested, but in the late 90s, a man confessed to the crime. Chris had become a student minister and went to see him. He found David McAllister, 77-year-old ex-convict, frail and blind, living in a North Miami Beach nursing home. Chris began visiting often. He read to McAllister from the Bible and prayed with him. His ministry opened the door for McAllister to receive Christ as his Savior and his Lord. And he said, while many people can't understand how I could forgive David McAllister, this is his quote. From my point of view, I couldn't not forgive him. I could not forgive him. Well, that's not very good English, right? That's a double negative. <laughs> what he meant is, I had to forgive him. And here's what he went on to say. If I've chosen to hate him all those years or spent my life looking for revenge, then I wouldn't be the man I am today. The man my wife and children love. The man. See, this is one of the devil's really, I think it's one of, not only one of his favorite lies, it's one of his most powerful lies, which is, don't let go. So here's what I ask you all to do this. So there's some pencils in front of you, or maybe you got a pen or pencil in your purse. So even if you're taking notes, you know, with the sermon notes here, if you're doing that, you got to get another pen or pencil in your non-writing hand, because I want everyone to hold on to something in your hand, for this next 50 minutes of sermon time. Anybody listening on? Okay, all right, a few of you. Can, no, it won't be 50 minutes. But I want you to, and you don't have to squeeze it like a death grip, but I do want you to, to hold on tight. If you, don't, if you don't have something, you can actually like just hold on to your thumb, but uh, hold on to a pencil there. And at the end of the sermon today, I'm gonna to share a prayer, asking God to help us to forgive. And at that point, I'll tell you in the middle of the prayer, go ahead and let go. Just give it, a tight squeeze, hold on to it during the message here, because this is Satan's lie. Don't let go. And even like I said to the kids, Satan wants us to think, oh, I'll show that person, I'm not going to forgive them. But what happens is, we end up in what I like to call a prison of grudges. And we're standing there in a cell, holding on to the door, the iron bars of this prison cell. But the door is open, it's actually unlocked, it could swing open, all we'd have to do is let go. But we listen and buy into the devil's lies, and we hold on, we hold on to that grudge, we don't forgive, and we find ourselves being in prison ones. But today it's beautiful that both in the Old Testament story, and the story of Joshua, we can learn a lesson about forgiving, even his siblings, you know, those who are supposed to be closest to him, we're going to learn to let go from him, and then in the gospel reading today that Myron shared, uh, we're going to learn some very important lessons from Jesus about learning to let go. So, lesson from Joseph. He was sold into slavery, literal slavery, by his brothers. And he says to them in our text of today, Genesis 45, verse 4, So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph whom you sold into Egypt. Now, imagine this, he was second in command, really, to Pharaoh. So in an instant, he could have had his brothers wiped out. He could have, you know, retaliated, had his moment of revenge. 
and so it would have been a little bit scary for them to realize, wait a minute, the guy second in charge of the whole country of Egypt? This is the guy we sold into slavery, and I bet they were pretty scared. But God had touched Joseph's heart, and God allowed Joseph to see how he was at work, even in not just being sold into slavery, but Joseph had all the ups and downs before he came into this position of power. It was not an easy life for him at all. But he says in verse 5, And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. And he says, For God sent me before you to preserve life. And so I put that in the sermon notes there, that God used Joseph being sold into slavery to preserve life, and not just Joseph's life, and not just his family's life, or even the Israelites' life, but probably millions of lives, at least hundreds of thousands, were saved because he saw and interpreted the dream about this coming of a seven-year famine, and they prepared for that famine. So many lives were preserved through the hand of God, working through even this very difficult time and mistreatment. And in some ways, I think the lesson from Joseph is keep score no more. Because a couple weeks ago, we heard that reading from Corinthians about love, right? All those different facets of love and things love does and things love does not. And one of the does not was love keeps no record of wrongs. And that's what Joseph had learned by the power of God to tear up <laughs> the debt that they owed him for selling him into slavery. And he said, no, I see God. God is at, at work. Uh, it, it reminds me a lot of the verse in the New Testament, the lesson that Paul learned himself. You know, Paul, man, talk about a rough life. And he even recounts, you know, how many times he was nearly beaten to death and stoned to death and shipwrecked and all these things he went through. And, and yet, Paul's the one who wrote, in all things, God works for good for those who love him. Uh, which, by the way, I want to just pause here and say, not everybody who's in the midst of, of deep hurt and sorrow will be ready to hear that verse, or even the, the story from Joseph. I think in some ways, this is a passage that the Spirit has to work in the heart of the hurt person. And a couple years ago, uh, I shared with our elders a book about ministering you know, to members, to people when they were going through a loss, like a death. And the title of the book was, Don't Sing Songs to a Heavy Heart. You know that uh, there'll be a time to encourage someone who's mourning to rejoice, but in the midst of their sorrow, maybe just come alongside of them and help them in their, in their hurt. And so I think this passage even sometimes is, people might not quite be ready for us to quote it to them. God is working for good, is there in the midst of it. But let the Spirit help them discover that themselves, like Paul did, like Joseph did, and certainly like our Savior did. Jesus knew exactly why he went through all the suffering and betrayal that he went through. He went through it for you and, and for me. So, what do we see? What's the result of God at work even in the midst of this difficulty with his family? Well, a joyful reunion. The end of our text says, uh, verse 14 and 15, Excuse me, then Joseph, he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept among them. It was a Kleenex fest, <laughs> right? And those weren't tears of sorrow, those were tears of joy. Because they had this joyful reunion. And you know, that won't happen without forgiveness. Because, you know, I've said this many times, sin breaks apart. And even in families. And so we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness so there can be that joyful reunion. So sold into slavery, but God was at work. God brings about this joyful reunion. And letting go is really important, not just spiritually, but, you know, psychiatrists and even physicians will talk about, you know, if you're carrying a lot of anger and hatred and malice towards somebody, it can really affect you physically. And I read a story about when Ronald Reagan, you remember when he was uh, had an assassination attempt on his life by John Hinckley? Well, his, his daughter, Patty Davis, she's written some books, uh, one of them about uh, his 
battle with Alzheimer's called the Long Goodbyes, um, which I've read some excerpts from. But she tells a story about the day after her dad had been shot by John Hinckley. He said this. The following day after the assassination attempt, my father said he knew his physical healing was directly dependent on his ability to forgive his attacker, John Hinckley. And she says, by showing me that forgiveness is the key to everything, including physical health and healing, he gave me an example of Christ-like thinking. And boy, I think that's very true. And it's definitely true emotionally, and it's absolutely true spiritually. We need to be able to forgive to really uh, have that, that peace uh, and that, that reunion. And as we're going to see with Jesus, uh, a joyful reconciliation. So let's look at Jesus' example. Uh, he wasn't sold into slavery. He was sold out. I mean, literally by Judas, right? 30 coins. This is the text from Matthew 26. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he saw an opportunity to betray him to sell him out. Now, you know, all the rest of the disciples, you know, they, they didn't want to admit, you know, who's, is it me? Is it me? Not me? And of course, good old brass, old Peter, you know, like, oh, or, you know, these other disciple types over here, they might deny you, but not me. <laughs> Yeah, he sold them out too. Not for 30 coins, but he, he denied him not once, not twice, three times. Jesus says in John 13 to Peter, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. You know, and we do it too. We deny Christ when we don't follow him, when we disobey him, when we say, I want to do what I want to do, Jesus, not what you want me to do. Sometimes I think you can say, I'll take the Savior part, Jesus, the Lord part, not so much. <laughs> right? And we sell him out too. So we need forgiveness just as much as Judas needed it, just as much as Peter needed it, just as much as every human being needed it. We need forgiveness. And that's why Jesus was willing to go through that. And in the Old Testament reading with Joseph, God used that to preserve life. But we know that Jesus his being sold out meant that he was able to give life. Give life. Eternal life. Abundant life. And you all heard me share my favorite Bible verse, John 10, 10. Jesus said, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full or have it abundantly. Uh, but then he says in the very next verse, And I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep so that we can live here and now with him but also in heaven with him forever. When there was forgiveness with Joseph and his brothers, there was this joyful reunion. When there's forgiveness with Christ, our brother, there's joyful reconciliation. And reconciliation is a beautiful word. It means something that's been torn apart, broken apart, is put back together. And that's what Jesus did. Early service, we had communion. We heard Jesus' word, you know, Take and eat, take and drink. This is my body, this is my blood. <clears throat> Given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. So we can be reconciled, you know, first to God, but then also to be reconciled to each other. And I don't think about that, the dual aspects of forgiveness and reconciliation when I make a sign of the cross between us and God and between us and one another. Jesus makes that joyful reconciliation possible. So that's kind of the you know, the why, why it's important to forgive and let go, but you know, the, the rubber hits the road when we have the question, but how do I do that? How do I forgive somebody when they have hurt me deeply? And sometimes, maybe they're not even aware of it, or sometimes they are aware of it, and they're not even going to acknowledge it, but we don't want to leave ourselves in that prison again of grudges not holding on. So how do we let go? Well, uh, Jesus gives us some really great um, prescriptions for how to love our enemy in the gospel reading. And he tells us some things that we should do, and then he tells us some things we should not do, or don't do this if you want to learn to let go. And when I was putting this together, and I had to tell Marius, this is one of the worst pastor 
mind to hover here, and I said, give him the Frank Sinatra treatment. And she's like, what? I said, yeah, Frank Sinatra. Doobie doobie doo. Right? He's just paying for that. Because he tells us to do something, he tells us to do be something, he tells us to do something. So you can think, whenever you want to, oh man, I'm having a hard time letting go, think of Frank Doobie doo. So let's start with the do. What does he say? What do we do for those who hurt us? He says, do good to your enemy. And, he, and then he kind of describes what that is. That includes even praying for them. That includes having mercy on them. Wow. It includes blessing them. So he says, do these things. He said in verse 27, But I say to you here, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. And by the way, in all of these, it's very clear for us to see, I can't do that by myself, and neither can you. That's just not our human nature. Our human nature wants to get revenge. So, to do good for those who are not doing much good to us. Some of you maybe have read some of the books by Corey Tenbu. One of her most famous books is The Hiding Place. Uh, her and her family lived in Scandinavia during World War II, and they kind of had their own underground railroad in their house where they would hide people to get them away from the Nazis. And uh, in the process, her father was killed. Her and her sister were interred in a prison camp. And in that camp, her sister died. And years later, she actually saw the guard at one of her presentations. And she was able to forgive him. Uh, he had become a Christian during the, the interim time. But anyway, the story I want to share is, while she, she was speaking in Africa, and this man came up to her, and his hands were all burned, had scar, uh, scars from burns on them. And she asked what happened to him. And she said, well, my neighbor's, this is what the man said, my neighbor's straw roof was on fire, and I helped him put it out. And then he showed me his burned hands. But she said, later on, I learned the whole story. The neighbor hated him and had set his roof on fire. And while his wife were asleep, the children were asleep in the house. Uh, they were in great danger. He said, fortunately, he was able to put out the fire on his house in time. But the sparks flew over to the roof of the man who had set his house on fire and set his house on fire. He said, there was no hate in the heart of this man. There was love for him because he put out the fire in the man's house with his own hands. That's how his hands Wow, that's doing this, isn't it? That's doing good for those who hate you. Showing that kind of love for the neighbor. So that's the do. One of the do be's is he says, do be generous. Yeah, do be generous. He says, give to everyone who begs from you and from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And he gives us another do be. Do be merciful. Be merciful. Even as your father is merciful. And again, in our goodness, we want to say, wait a minute, God, they don't deserve it. They haven't even said, I'm sorry. They haven't even said, please forgive me. And then God can turn to every one of us and say, guess who else doesn't deserve love and forgiveness? My love and my forgiveness. And this is where we all can point to ourselves and say, I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. None of us do. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's called mercy. He gives it to us anyway, in spite of ourselves. He loves us when we are unlovable, and he calls us to love others when they are unlovable. But what about the don'ts? And these are hard, too. And these require the power of God, the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and all of these. He says, don't retaliate. You know? I mean, our first reaction, if someone slaps you in the face, your first reaction is, I want to slap them right back, right? But he says, no, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From the one who takes away your clothes, do not withhold your tunic either. Wow, that takes a God size love. Don't demand payback, he says in verse 35. Love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And then comes one of the ones I think is really hard for every human being. He says, don't judge. That's not our job. 
Our job is not to judge the heart and soul of another human being. That's in the Lord's hands. So he says that in verse 37. Let me just read 37 and 38 to you, uh, from our text. As uh, Myron shared it. Then I want to reread it for you from the message. And if any of you have ever read the message translation, it kind of takes scripture and just puts it in the way you and I speak in our, in our everyday language. So in our ESV translation, it says, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your life. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And here's the message. Don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. And I've always been through a thing. It comes back and haunts us. Be easy on people, you'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life, you'll find your life given back. Not merely given back, but given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So I, I grabbed this out of our kitchen system. Uh, I used that text before to talk about stewardship, you know, where it says, uh, with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So I have, this is an eight cup, uh, measuring cup here, and this is a quarter teaspoon. So which, how much love and blessing and forgiveness would you like God to be giving to you? Would you like him to be using one of these? Or this? Right? <laughs> I think we'd all choose, yeah, I want that too. But then sometimes we turn around, but then we're just kind of stingy. Again, not just in sharing our earthly blessings and things like that. But here, in particular, the context is talking about mercy and forgiveness and love. Not to be stingy with that, but to let it flow, pour it out freely, because we do really get blessed back in return. Because when we're not, where are we? We are trapped. So I want to share this prayer with you. And, and I did, I ran some copies of this prayer. They're on the little table as we leave. If you want to grab one. Uh, Pastor Larry um, Hepton, he's a non-denominational pastor at Cross Point Community Church in Arkansas. Interesting, he's a Christian author too, and he wrote a book called I Can't Forgive. How to be free from unforgiveness. He's also the chaplain for Tyson Foods, so he hangs out with a lot of chickens, I guess, as, as well. But I found this prayer, and it's a beautiful prayer to pray when you find yourself like this, stuck, having a hard time letting go. So in the middle of this, I'll you know, give you, uh, encourage you to let go of whatever you're holding on to. So let me share this prayer for us and with us. Lord, my heart has been wounded hurt me deeply, but anger, bitter, because this happened. I have not been able to let go. I wonder many times, where were you when this happened? I acknowledge a spirit of unforgiveness has taken over me, and it's not who you are. I cannot do this. Turn from unforgiveness now. Cleanse my heart of anger, bitterness, resentment, revenge that I have towards the one who hurt me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me the power to overcome my flesh. Let me walk in the freedom of your forgiveness. Let me see the one who hurt me through your eyes. Help me take my offender to the cross and leave him there. Cover his face with the precious blood of Jesus until I see him no longer. I forgive the one who sinned against me and against you, and I invite you to let go. If the enemy comes in like a flood and brings back bitterness to my heart, I will stand on this confession. I leave final judgment in your hands and will no longer offer or take hold of this sin on his or her account. I am no longer a slave to the cancer of unforgiveness. I praise your powerful name for my freedom. In Jesus' name, Amen. Freedom. Amen.
we have opportunity to give thanks to our loving and forgiving God, and as we uh, give our tithes and offerings to the Lord, the choir is also going to share their gifts with us as they sing many gifts in one spirit.
and in our prayers for today, you see uh, several petitions there, and I have some other prayers for comfort. Susan Anderson's father, John Green, passed away on the 16th, so we lift them up in our prayers for comfort, and, and also the Holes family there here, uh, friends of theirs, Virginia Darrell and Casey, lost their son and brother uh, in an ATV accident, so we lift up uh, that family as they mourn that loss. Uh, Jeannie Heitman asked for prayers for her relative Jerry. He's been uh, battling COVID, but he's home from the hospital on uh, oxygen at home and others dealing with those complications and those caring for them. Uh, Marble Craft is going to have shoulder replacement surgery on, on Tuesday and Bill Varner back surgery tomorrow. So we pray those procedures go well. So we lift these up to the Lord. Lord of love and Lord of forgiveness, as you have freely loved and forgiven us, may we offer those gifts of mercy and grace to others when they sin against us, that we may be reflections of your love, Lord, and keep no record of wrongs, that we might experience joyful reunions and joyful reconciliation in you, Lord, and through you. May your Easter victory over sin and death and the devil give comfort to Virginia and Casey as they mourn the death of their son and brother. We echo those prayers for comfort for Susan Anderson and her family mourning the death of her father, John. Continue to be with the Brodericks as they mourn Betty's brother, Bill's passing, and with the Heitmans and their family at the death of her uncle, Clue. Uh, we continue to lift up Bill Benjamin's family, Tom and Bruce and Mary, as they mourn his passing. And Father, we uh, rejoice in all the ways you provide for us healing and strength to our bodies and our spirits. Continue to be with Hank and Martha as they recover from their surgeries. Be with Marvel and, and Bill as uh, they have their procedures this week. Guide the surgeons and all those that will care for them and in their recovery. Continue to be with Susan Gentry and Jenny Harris and uh, Diane Davis. We lift up Jay Weldon to you and uh, Shirley Henschel's Aunt Caroline who's battling pneumonia. We also lift up neighbors of the Grays, Allison and her uh, health issues. Be with Dan and Doris Lucas and we pray for continued healing and strength for them. Uh, we give thanks for the ways that you provide treatments for those fighting cancer. Uh, with the Bakers, we give thanks that their friend Susan has completed a portion of her cancer treatments, but bless her as she moves on to this new phase. And we continue to place Genevieve and Joe and Cindy and Susan and Becky and my cousin Sarah and Danny and others um, and Michael Hall into your hands as they deal with this disease. And Heavenly Father, we also want to pray for Rebecca and her mother Rhonda and give them a safe journey home. And also bless her with wisdom and discernment, uh, Lord, as she decides uh, according to your will if this will be the place for her to serve and use her gifts and talents in our school ministry. And we also pray, Heavenly Father, for our child care and learning center as we seek a full time director of that ministry. We have many opportunities to share your love, hope, and peace with these children and their families. So we offer all these petitions to you, Lord, as we join in the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. And Soul Fire will lead us in our closing song, and then we'll go with our mission statement in the center.